Uh, it is September 26th, 2016, and this is the uh, Economic and Community Development Committee. Uh, so, uh, I'm James Bonsell, the chairperson. Uh, we've also got Andrew Clark and Marilyn Hanrahan here. So, uh, the two items that are on the agenda today, we're going to talk about uh, MSD and, I guess, uh, stormwater management. Uh, basically, we're going to, our council members are going to discuss, uh, you know, kind of what, where we want to go from here with regards to uh, MSD, what kind of data we might want to get. Uh, do we want to invite MSD to come to a future council meeting um, or, a future, or even a future committee meeting? Our open records law, our open records laws require us to not, we can't do a whole lot via email. We need, have to do a lot of it in public, so that's kind of what the point of that is. Uh, the second item on the agenda is we're going to talk about, uh, I guess, parking policy. Uh, basically, the uh, there's like three components to it. Um, you know, you can't have a car parked on uh, public streets for more than uh, 16 hours at a time, and then at, at that point you're in violation. So, the police department only enforces it once they get a complaint, uh, and then. Uh, they give a citation and then eventually it'll be towed. So we'll talk about that as well. But first I wanted to open the floor uh, for, I guess, any public comment on either of the agenda items. Uh, so basically it's gonna give three minutes to uh, each person that wants to speak. Uh, so uh, is there anybody present that would like to speak on either of the agenda items? Okay, yeah, excellent. So actually, if you'll just come up to, yeah, to the uh, podium here and then just state your name and your address for us. David Cutler, 4300 Ashland Avenue. Um, just had a very short comment about parking enforcement. Um, I really am not sure what this discussion is going to be, but I'd like to point out that um, you know quite a few people in Norwood don't have garages and they need to park on the street. And having to move one's car every 16 hours, I think, is an imposition particularly since they're uh, on most streets anyway, there's plenty of parking. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Cutler. Uh, would anybody else like to speak on? Uh, excellent. Uh, Dana Bull, 3947 Ellesmere. And um, I believe that although the intention of the parking enforcement is, the intention is good, I believe that the amount of time that's allowed before it's towed, it basically encourages, you know, tit for tat and retaliatory behavior on the part of neighbors that maybe use it and basically misuse the police's time. I know that in my situation, I have tenants, they park on the street. I had a tenant unwittingly go away to Salt Lake City for two weeks to see his family once, parked on the street. And fortunately, he left a key for me so I could move his car, but he never dreamed in a million years that that would not be okay. Late model car in good condition, just parked on the street because that's where he parks. It's the public right away. Um, I've also had a situation where I have a neighbor who uh, just enjoys kind of getting into it. Uh, I had a car die as I was leaving the house, parked it on the street, went away for a couple days, came back, my car was gone. And I mean, it was like three days. She must have called right away and said, this car's disabled. If they ticketed it 18 hours, I mean, when you start the clock running, now, my neighbor adjacent to me had a car sit for, no kidding, two years. He had two Volkswagens, I'm sure you know which one I'm talking about on Ellesmere. Never called about him. So what happens is the enforcement becomes very situational. And I feel that that portion of it needs to be remediated. Obviously, we don't want disabled cars in this street. Obviously, we don't want, you know, um, a situation where people are storing cars in the street like we do on Slane. Um, but for my part, I, unfortunately, I feel that the police come out and, you know, when I paid my ticket, I said, did, did you run my plate? My address, I'm a homeowner, I own a large property, the car was in front of it. So I think the law gets misused 
because some people don't have anything better to do than call. God bless you. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Bull. Would anybody else like to speak on? Um, my name's Michelle Lomboy. I live at 4211 Franklin Avenue. Um, my car was, um, they had been doing work. Uh, my landlord, the day of the flood, the day of the flood, when I came home, and so by fluke, I had parked a couple doors down on the street, you know, the closest that I could to my house. Well, it ended up being that is exactly where the water gathered when, you know, this all happened. And I mean, my car was completely submerged underwater. You know, it was a total loss. Um, I did get ticketed and, you know, after the fact, I got ticketed about two weeks later, I got a 16 hour ticket. Um, when I, and then I put it in neutral and, you know, we tried to push it back out, you know, a little bit so it would at least, you know, as much as we could. And um, <clears throat> in this, the process of the time, I was waiting to hear back from MSD because I, I had heard that they were maybe taking care of vehicles or, you know, offering some type of compensation. I don't know. But they said, you know, after I did get a hold of them, they said they were because it was on the street. But, you know, after I was ticketed, I mean, it was that was on Wednesday. I was ticketed Friday. I come home from work and my car was gone. Towed, no notice, no anything. You know, when I did, I did move the, the car, you know, so the 16 hour thing, it was it was moved. But, you know, I couldn't move it very far, obviously. And I already had a junkyard on and on the way to, you know, to get me, but they couldn't get there till Saturday. So they were scheduled to come and everything. So I don't really know what, <laughs> what else to say about that as far as, I just don't think that that ticket was, I mean, you know, I couldn't do anything about it. I was working on it. I, <laughs> I just couldn't do anything fast enough, basically. So. Excellent. Well, I definitely appreciate you sharing your story with us. Thank you so much. Okay. Is there anybody else? Excellent. Okay. Awesome. So, uh, you know, I guess back to our first agenda item for now. We're, we are going to talk. Well, I guess we would. Yeah, let's talk about our first agenda item first for MSD. We're going to get. We will get to parking here in just a uh, a bit. So. Uh, so, you know, of course we had the floods, uh, flood a couple of, uh, well, I guess flooding we had a couple of, uh, weeks ago, uh, you know, hundreds of homes. We had, we had sewer backups. We had, you know, on the street, we had, you know, in the low lying areas, like on Franklin where, uh, Miss Lomboy's car was parked. We had, you know, flooding there that was covering cars. Uh, and so, you know, in the aftermath of this, MSD gave a, uh, public information session. Uh, at that session, they said that, you know, this is the worst flooding that they've ever had when it comes to the sewer backups. I mean, it was far, I mean, just far and exceeded anything they've ever had before. And so if that's true, it, it seems like there's something kind of maybe extraordinary about, you know, what is going on in this specific area, even though it was an extraordinary storm, I'm sure there's been storms like that in the past where there hasn't been as much sewer backup. So, uh, you know, when I hear from residents about, uh, you know, their wedding albums that, you know, they've been married 45 years and their wedding album's completely gone and they've you know, lost so many other things, uh, you know, MSU is doing a great job, I think, of compensating for the, you know, the things that actually you can put value on, but there's a lot of things that you can't put value on. So, uh, you know, when I hear this, this story, um, I just wanted to make sure that we as a council are, you know, asking any questions that we think that we need to ask, uh, making sure that we provide opportunity here, except for residents to speak on it, uh, and seeing if there's anything that, you know, we might want to do from here uh, when it comes to that. I know we're kind of limited because we're not MSD, of course, yeah, but I wanted to provide that opportunity for us to talk about that if there's something we have on our mind there. Well, has MSD given any indication of any time limits that they're going to have on claims or um, for people to submit claims that they had at that meeting? Yeah. Did they say what type of time limits they had, if any? Was it, you were there also. I believe they said they typically try to get them paid out within 20 days, 28 days, but they are they know they're going to be way behind and they didn't give us a time limit. Yeah. And I don't know anybody who, I do know of anyone who has been uh, compensated yet. I have not personally heard, but 
Okay, sorry, that was timer. Yeah, I have not personally heard of anybody that's gotten their compensation yet. Uh, I haven't, I'm not gonna say I've inquired to a, whole, a lot of people either about that, so, but I haven't heard of it. They just ask that everyone uh, fill out the forms as fast as they can and get them in. Yeah, and, and I think it's a good question. I'll make sure I follow up with the MSD on that to find out what that time frame really is so we can get that out there. Uh, it did seem like that they're kind of not following their full process, you know, uh, comes to, you know, justifying the damages like they might normally do. They Normally they'd send a claim person out to your house and they do, they would, there's a lot that they would do to, to make sure that the claim is actually valid. And because they know there's so many and they just can't get to them all, I think they're making it a lot easier for, nor for residents to, uh, you know, submit the information without having to feel like they have to prove every little penny. You know, it seems like it's just a bit looser than it, it normally would be. Is that? But they still have to call MSD. Um, MSD, I believe, still hasn't passed to come out. I mean, they should have come out in the beginning. I don't think you can just say, I have a claim and, and send it in without um, filling out the forms and having MSD come and check to make sure it was sewer backup and not just stormwater. Yeah, and actually, and, and that, that's a great point. You definitely have to fill out the claim form. You have to, you've got to do that. Uh, but I think that they were able to establish, <clears throat> they were saying at that, uh, I guess, meeting at the high school, that they were able to establish based on like other houses nearby that had the damage and other, th a lot of times they were able to establish without having to come out. And if they weren't, I think then they would come out. But there's some people that, I mean, I, I heard that they were like express passing. They knew within 24 hours that they were going to be approved. Not that they were getting money, but they knew that they, hey, MSD knows it's our fault uh, type of situation. Uh, which is reassuring to me that that's pretty good customer service to know pretty soon. It's a lot of uh, peace of mind for the, those residents, knowing that they would get covered eventually, whenever that, that date might be. Um, so, I mean, Mr. Sanker, you know, like I said, I haven't lived here my whole life. Uh, I mean, has there been any other, like, situations, anything similar to this that uh, you remember growing up or? No, well, I mean, there's always sometimes when there's heavy rains where some places will back up more than others but um, I don't remember anything like we had last month um, I mean it wasn't just here I mean my daughter's place over in Oakley was the same way the MSD did come out to their street and uh, told them to fill out the claim forms I did, did they come out to I your place or I had a, they, you know, told me to fill out the claim forms, and I faxed that from my work, the claim form. And he said that um, if I got my own person, like a mechanic or whatever, to come out and check it out, that that would speed up the process. Um, because then they, I guess they wouldn't have to send someone out, but we never made it that point. My car was gone. So now, not only am I out, my car totaled, I'm out the little 115 bucks I was going to get from a scrap dealer. I mean, now I just feel like I got a double way Yeah. 
information. Okay. And we'll definitely talk about that more in just a few minutes here when we get to the parking uh, aspect of it. Uh, so is there anything that we want to add? Like, so we're going to, you know, I'm going to find out about paying out. How much have they paid out? Uh, how many houses uh, were affected in Norwood? Um, and actually, hopefully, maybe I can get some addresses just so I, we can kind of see, you know, the places with the heaviest damage. But uh, is there anything else that we'd like to ask MSD? Would we like to ask somebody to come and talk to us uh, and answer questions? Is there, do we feel like they're handling it appropriately? Is there any... Have you talked to anyone in the city who has been working with them? I have not personally. Have you, by chance? Do you know if anybody? No, I know that the fire, I went to a couple of meetings and the fire department was there. Um, Mr. Stith was there, I was there. Um, and I know Mr. Stith, um, he had some steps he was taking, so was the fire department to get the actual list of how many people were affected and that, you know, what, what type of damage each property had. Gotcha. Was anybody from the administration at those meetings? Or was it the fire chief and Mr. Smith? Uh, oh, and, um, oh gosh, the assistant fire chief, Steve. Um, oh. Yes, Steve okay. Rump. The four of us went. Great. I do know right afterwards, uh, they were working with the county on inspections with fire building safety director um, because they come in here St. Bernard Cincinnati putting the, trying to put together a comprehensive um, list of the damages for all the surrounding communities to uh, potentially file I'm not quite sure what it was what they where they were filing whether it was with MSD or the state at I cannot answer that however um, they were, were going to apply as a um, a group and not just okay the city of Norwood we had these many houses damaged we might not have qualified but as the center area of where this took place they were the county they came out because it was all Hamilton County came out to do the inspection with all the, the people that were affected, the different cities and that. So uh, where that went or, or uh, where it was submitted or who submitted it, uh, it, I know the county was heavily involved with that at the time. And that was shortly after the, um, the 28th or whenever it happened. So uh, it, it was the um, Ohio Emergency Management Agency. Is that who That's they were filing with? Yeah. Okay, great. So I guess a lot of my concerns stem from the fact that, uh, you know, from what, what I'm hearing from MST, we have, uh, so we've got three types of, I guess, pipes underground in the city that uh, take away water or sewage. We've got uh, pipes that are uh, a combined sewer and stormwater pipes. So uh, I guess CSO, I guess, type things, um, or those combined pipes. We've got pipes that carry, you know, just sewer only, and we've got pipes that carry stormwater only. Uh, and so, and normally when you have a stormwater only pipe, a lot of times those will go directly to a river or a stream. But in Norwood, uh, all of our pipes, whether they're sewer, they're combined, or they're stormwater, uh, from what we've heard, uh, from what I've heard from MSD uh, and from other people at the city, uh, those pipes all bind together when they go into the city of Cincinnati uh, and go into, a, I guess, a combined pipe. So even if they're stormwater separate, it all gets combined when it goes to the city of Cincinnati. And so I guess my, my concern, I guess something that I want to find out is, uh, you know, is, are there, based on, you know, where these geographically, where, where all these homes are located, you know, are there some key areas, like, you know, right where those, you know, for example, maybe where those pipes leave the city of Norwood, are there some key areas that MSD can make some improvements on that can save, one, save MSD money in the future for this so these sewer backups don't happen, but two, uh, you know, help residents so that we don't have you know this some of the same type of flooding in this exact same places in the future and especially considering that this was a record occurrence for msd msd's never had a sewer backup event anything close to what happened here uh, i'm hoping that uh, you know we could get some information and maybe msd can look at this to see if there are some of those key improvements that could be made that we could kind of 
save some of this hassle in the future. And, you know, of course, we're not talking about renovating the whole city's structure, you know, every pipe under the city. We're just talking about some key areas where maybe we can get some bigger pipes or something can change, something change. And so I don't know exactly what those are yet. I think that's kind of what uh, our next step from here is to try to find out what, you know, if MSD has any consulting services or even OKI, the Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana Regional Council of Governments, if they have any consulting services for, you know, what, it, looking at the data, looking at where all these houses are, looking at the, the cars that were damaged on the street to see, hey, if we make improvements here, it'll, it'll pay off by having less, you know, damage, you know, potentially in this this area in the future so in my head that kind of that's where i'm at right now i mean that's kind of how i'm feeling um that's what i mean if if the data that i'm interested in you know i attended the uh the um uh, thing at the middle school i can't think of what what the the event at the middle school the the MSD. Yeah. MSD. Yeah. msd information yeah. session um and so several residents were saying that, you know, over the course of the last 10 years that their basements have backed up on different occasions. Nothing this extreme, obviously, but um, I'd just be interested to maybe look at that data, kind of what you're saying, and just, you know, is there, because one of the residents mentioned they had talked about doing some sort of water basin collection area or something. Is there just small improvements that could be done like that um, that would save in the long run because, you know, like the lady, there was a lady on Ashland Avenue who had some kind of pump or something in her basement that, but it just couldn't keep up with this. So is there um, small minor improvements that could be done, or what areas are are backups occurring most frequently? Um, I know MSD said that the amount of money that they need to do all those improvements they don't have, which we can understand. But um, are there just areas we could target? You know, as you've mentioned, that really, really make you know small improvements but that in the long run would make a major impact so that would be the data i mentioned and just the multiple backups where are they occurring the most frequently excellent can i suggest before a meeting would be set with msd that someone sit down with mr gears who has the history of a lot of this um already in his head <laughs> or documented somewhere um, so you don't uh, reinvent the wheel here. No, I, th I think, honestly, I think that's a great idea. Uh, and I'll reach out to him to see if he might be you know, amicable to that. Uh, so if, if he is, I will make sure that uh, we take the time and that we can you know, try to do that for sure. Uh, I, I did talk with Mr. Gears about, so, so there is something out there called a Norwood Stormwater, I think, district. Uh, and so, I mean, this is, it's basically a, uh, there was an EPA mandate that we had to assess, I think, our systems in uh, every so often or at some point, I'm not exactly sure what happened, but we were basically paying the county. I think we, we had like, we have a $6 a year or something a fee per residence that we was charging. Mr. Sanker, please correct me anywhere I'm wrong here, but there's a fee that gets charged per resident. I think it brings in somewhere between like 60 or $100,000 a year. And we're basically paying that to MSD to be our stormwater district. And I think a couple of years ago, the council decided, hey, uh, we need to quit paying this money to MSD for, you know, they, they did services initially, but they haven't done anything since. And so Norwood created their own. And so instead of sending that money to MSD, we sent it here. Uh, so we, it's like, you know, it's less than $100,000. And it gets used for like when there are like a stormwater sewer, stormwater like pipe breaks or there's something going, I mean, it gets used to fix stormwaters, but it's not very much uh, that goes there. And so, you know, Norwood is respond. We're in, you know, when we talked about those three pipes, the sewer, the combined, and the stormwater. In Norwood, there's places where we have a sewer, and then a stormwater only pipes. And in those kind of places, Nor the city of Norwood, right now, for, based on what we understand, uh, you know, I think the mayor's working on trying to change this, but we are responsible for the stormwater uh, pipes. So, uh, I don't. I mean, I don't know if there any of these damages that we have uh, were caused by stormwater only pipes overflowing. And if it wasn't just because where we go into the city of Cincinnati was too full, you know, like if it all just backed up from there. But, uh, you know, if we were to ever get fund, if we were to ever want to have funding to do any kind of stormwater pipe improvements under the city, uh, I mean, it seems to me that, you know, it would have to co it would cost money. We don't have the, you know, the money just can't, it's not going to magically happen without, you know, financing so just something to consider in the future that 
it does improve, you know, it's stormwater only improvements, the ones that are the streets where they have the separate pipes, and we, and those improvements need to be made. Uh, it's on the city of Norway to do, so, which, you know, we've got a lot of other budgetary issues that we're dealing with right now, so there's, you know, we're not able to do anything uh, with that right now, but I just wanted to make sure citizens knew. But the, the combined sewers and the, the sewer only pipes, those are on MSD to, to deal with, so. Uh, Hopefully, where there were issues, it would be more of those combined and those storm uh, The combined are just the sewer only. Okay, is there anything else we want to talk about on this subject? Okay, so um, we're going to try to get done at 6.15, so we'll spend the last 20 minutes talking about uh, parking. And so as we heard from a couple of different, <laughs> or three different residents tonight about, uh, you know, there's a ton of issues. There really are quite a few issues that go into uh, you know, I guess the parking enforcement when it comes to the 16 hour rule and then, you know, the enforcement of that. And so, you know, just kind of recap, we've, you know, this, the police department, or, well, right now you're only allowed to have your car on the, on the street for 16 hours. After the, when the police department gets a complaint, the first day they'll actually go out and mark the tire and mark the curb so that they can see kind of where that car was. Uh, on the second day, if they go back to the location, they still see that the, the markings still match up on the tire and the curb. Uh, they'll give a citation. And then the third day that they will tow the car after that. And so uh, yeah, I've gotten a couple calls from, you know, quite a few, well, a couple calls from residents on the subject, uh, which is why we added it to the agenda. But, uh, you know, there's a couple of concerns that I, I personally have, and I want to kind of hear from you all about and see if there's something that we might want to do. But, uh, you know, the first one is the 16-hour limit, just in general. Uh, the, you know, when Norwood had, what, 50,000 employees every, you know, that were in the city, and not, not a lot of them had off-street parking, or not all of them had off-street parking, I mean, it made, it, and when we had, I think we had 30,000 actual residents that lived in the city at some point back, uh, back then. You know, it, I guess it made a lot of sense to have you know really strict parking policies because we we honestly like we the parking was very scarce I'm sure at that time. Uh, but I mean I think that all of us that don't have off street parking or that we that do park on the street occasionally have probably left our car out for more than 16 hours at a time. I mean I you know I, I know that I have. Uh, and so I guess this, the question becomes, uh, does this policy, I know we talked about this when I brought up the bike policy, does this policy get used only as retaliation, you know, or as, you know, neighbors that just are frustrated with their neighbors, so they'll call about that policy, you know, when there's probably other things that they're actually frustrated about. Uh, and then the second part of this is, you know, giving residents a warning so they get the, they'll get a citation on that second day. So that the first day they mark it, the second day they get the citation. There's not really a warning in between that site. I mean, I guess the citation is a warning, but there's not a really a notice to the residents that hey, if you don't move your car, your car is getting towed. And I mean, and and they're really good about towing it. It's not, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it it's the very next day and usually in the morning. And so. Uh, I would like to see, personally, I'd like to see us find a way, either the police department or, uh, I, I don't know, I, I would like to see, find a way that we can give a notice to the residents when they get that citation saying, hey, your car is going to get towed. And so I did talk to Chief Kramer about this, and Chief Kramer really kind of just wanted to hear from council on the, the situation in general, which honestly, I'm happy he did, because one council member shouldn't really influence something, you know, a policy like that. So, you know, I definitely wanted to get your all's feedback to see, you know, on both the 16-hour uh, policy and on the, uh, you know, giving some kind of a notice or some kind of a warning to residents. And, and the last thing with that 16-hour policy, uh, I did have a, a resident call me today that, uh, you know, gave the idea of having some kind of a different limit if you live on the block or live, you know, within a block of where you're actually parked. So, I mean, not the, the spot in front of our house is not always open, but if you're re reasonably parked right near where you live, uh, you know, he was thinking that there could be some kind of other, you know, he suggested to us or he suggested to me to, to mention that maybe there could be another limit, whatever that number might be for people who actually live in that area. So anyways, with that, I just wanted to open it up and see kind of what your all's thoughts were. Is there any sort of... I'm thinking about myself and I just went out of town this past weekend and we have two cars and my car does not fit in the driveway because we have like retaining walls so I was parked on the street probably for three straight days um, but is there anything that like like if I were to call the police department I'm going on vacation 
that they could put my car on a list or something to where I would not be, you know, obviously my car, I'm not leaving it parked there all the time. It's just, you know, I'm out of town. I don't need the car. Um, don't have a necessarily a driveway to put it in. Do you know if there's anything that the police department has like that where people could call? Yeah, I mean, do you know Mr. Sinker? Yeah. No, I, oh, okay, okay. I'm not saying it. it I'm just thinking that something on that line would be good because be, even with your credit cards, if you're if you haven't used them outside of the 200 mile radius, yeah. and all of a sudden they see charges popping up from New York or New Jersey or wherever, yeah. you know they'll they'll shut it off. Right. Um, so you have to usually call them or send them a note. But I think if something like that how you could put something like that into effect, I don't know. And the other thing would be how you would make residents aware of that procedure um, would be the other thing. Because it sounds like, this, oh, like in your case, this sounds like most of the reactions were um, people calling deliberately on people down there. And it wasn't just like the, the cruisers just happen to go down the street and say, oh, shoot, that car's been there for 16 hours. You know, people are calling to kind of rat you out, I guess, or um, which uh, in that case, I mean, it, it kind of a, you know, a tough call because it, it's there. And if they if they don't do it or unless they put a warning on there, hey, we got a call, you know, a little advisory thing, we got a call on your car. Um, hadn't been moved, you know, for whatever it would see. And then if you see that and you would move it, but if you're out of town and that's put on there, you wouldn't even know it was on there to begin with. So it wouldn't, wouldn't help matters there. But um, it just sounds like it's enforced when people are calling to complain and not necessarily complain because it's putting them at an inconvenience. It's they're calling to complain to make it an inconvenience for the property owner or the the car owner. Um, where it, if I'm, I would think that it was originally put into place for the fact where there are some people that might have two drivers in the house and have six cars, then they park and just leave them sit out in front of the neighbor's house for an extended period of time and in that case there you know it would kind of get a little frustrating however um you know we you can't really tell people how many cars you can own either so I, I don't know um i don't know that you could eliminate all uh, restrictions as far as time wise that you can park in a particular area because if somebody did have more cars than they needed they could just line them up and leave them there and they might not drive them as long as they have plates on them they may not drive them for a few weeks at a time which in that case would be a little frustrating um, for the surrounding neighbors so i don't know that you can could necessarily remove the whole um, 16 hour limit but rather there are some ways I don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying ways around it but if there are ways to uh, soften it so that the people the, the owner of the car has an opportunity to move it prior to that happening although in your case you, you, you know you really didn't have an opportunity to um, so in that case there I don't um, that. Right, but and and and, and typically, in most places or most, nobody would call and complain. I mean, I know. Um, I mean, I I can tell you right now, on my way to work in the morning and back from work in the morning, I can name three cars on three different streets. Well, one car on three different streets, so it's three total cars that. Um, I know haven't moved in a couple days at a time, you know, and, and um, but it, they're not, they're not, you know, in anybody's way and they're not, but, it, and they, they live there and it's, they just don't use their car. 
And uh, so in that case there, it's kind of a, an inconvenience, especially um, if, if the resident, you know, like we were saying earlier, if you punch it up on the screen and it says, oh, that car belongs to, you know, Mrs. Hanrahan, she lives right there. Um, okay, we'll either walk away from it because it's a resident right here, but if it's still here two days from now, I, I don't I don't know what the I don't think there's an easy answer I don't think there's a perfect answer but I would think that there may be some um, alternatives than just 16 hours move it after 16 hours tow it I mean I, I think that may be kind of on the um, the extreme now i know in some areas of some other cities they we don't have them but they'll they'll ticket them and then put a boot on them to so you can't drive the car so if you went out to move it after three days and they have a boot on it you'd have to call you know to to get that removed but that's not a not a real friendly answer either because it was because the car still <laughs> nobody was happy when it happens to them yeah. so but um, rather there's some middle ground where we can you know either give a warning or somehow get the word out to residents that if you are going to be gone for on vacation that because really quite honestly that that is um, you're not deliberately parking it there it just you're not going to be home and it's in front of your house and you don't have a driveway so I mean you can't take it with you um, so I, I would think there'd have to be some type of procedure or uh, where you could report in that, hey, I'm going to be gone for two weeks without telling all the neighbors because then they'll all just come and break in your car. They know you're not going to be here. But if the police knew or somebody knew or there was when they punch it up and they say, oh, yeah, but they're, they'll be back on Sunday or something to that effect where um, they can at least have a record of it and possibly some type of alternative solution than just you know ticket and tow um, don't know what the perfect scenario would be and I don't know whether the chief had any ideas or he basically wanted to hear from the council it sounded like on on that and I, and I don't well in Maryland did you have uh, something you wanted to add there um, yeah I did um, you can go on vacation now and when you, you can call the police and they'll come and check your house while you're gone and sometimes you call in I've actually filled out a form before but they would know you were gone then um, I like my house checked on when I'm on vacation yeah. and they'll leave little cards saying I was here this date the officer will um, the only other thing is with the time limit I think we have to be aware of like Montgomery Road and those places with um, uh, meters I mean, for I think that the limits on those, I think 16 hours is probably okay. Um, it's reasonable. We had an incident on Montgomery Road where somebody left their truck there day after day after day after day, and it was an issue. Um, they even at, then they got to the point where they'd move it, and then but it would come back, and it was we had an issue with the blocking traffic. Um, so I think if we're going to look at changing these, we have to uh, consider what we want to do on Montgomery Road and with meters. Yeah, I mean, I think with, with regards to blocking traffic, if there, if, car, if there is an issue with traffic at a specific time of day and there's not like, you know, a no parking sign during that time, you know, we might want to look at possibly just, you know, having some of those, um, like no parking during rush hour time, you know, sign added to that for sure. Um, do you it was taken care of. Oh, perfect. Okay. It was taken care of. Good, good, good. Okay. Um, and can I ask if Mr. Gary would have anything to say on this? Would that be okay? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love that. If you don't want, yeah. Yeah. Um, somewhere with the microphone so the residents at home or can hear. There. Yeah. Uh, either way. And just, we've got about five minutes left until uh, the next scheduled meeting, so we'll probably conclude this at 6.15. I just got a dental filling, so my mouth is numb. Oh, I'm sorry. But um, <laughs> I think it's fair to say that the police generally don't issue 
uh, citations for 16 hour parking unless the parking is pointed out to them by some resident or some caller or what have you and then they will go out and mark the, mark you know chalk the tire and the curb perhaps um, uh, or some uh, in some other way mark it and then return the next day and then issue a citation and then the next day potentially tow that's a you know and i don't think that normally the police are out looking for that kind of infraction um unless they're concerned about some particular suspect car um i mean they'll certainly tag the you know the expired plates and that sort of thing but um my understanding is that the police are basically responding to calls in the course of issuing those 16 hour citations um and occasionally they're challenged in the mayor's court and there's generally not a, a great way to challenge them factually i think it's a 35 dollar ticket um that's all i've got to say i don't i, I can't necessarily recommend mm -hmm. you know a policy course one way or the other um each of these things sound i mean there's there's a balancing to be done and maybe maybe it's been correctly done maybe it hasn't i didn't get a chance to hear any of the residents before i walked in late um I, so i didn't hear what all was said but yeah there were just concerns about like it being used as a retaliatory retaliatory thing at times sure. and then there were other concerns just about a lack of warning uh, sure before the towing part of it yeah so, uh, um nothing would keep the police from writing on the back of the citation or on the citation somewhere sure. that there's you know that there's they could be towed after the citation or within 20 hour, 24 hours of the citation or whatever it is and i i know for example the situation that ms hanrahan referred to um there was a, there was marking of the tires there was a citation and then the next uh event was a was a tow i mean it's not I wouldn't say that's common, but it's also not unheard of. Gotcha. Okay. Excellent. Does that help at all? It does. Thank you, Mr. Gary. It took him five minutes. <laughs> you did great. You did great, though. Yeah. Uh, that was Tim Gary. He's the uh, assistant law director. Mr. Bonson. Yes. There's a woman who has a question. I don't know if you're yeah, taking it. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. I came in late, too. I'm Renee Longboy. I'm her mother. Yes. I just wanted to ask about this. If there was anything you could possibly do to um, help with the Reese thing of where they towed her car. Apparently, they towed the people across the street too. Their red car got towed. So, I mean, it's not just her, but is there any way council itself could write a letter and say Norwood jumped the gun too fast and towed it before, That's you know, she was, I know it ain't Reese's, but she just got the ticket and then while she's at work the next day when she's calling around. Well, and the thing is, I don't think that they are in the and they could have told by the way the uh, the, t uh, the roof was up that the uh, uh, whole engine was debris full and the car inside was soft and wet i mean it's not like we just left it sit forever you know yeah. there was a reason and she goes to work the next morning and when she comes home she's trying to call she has to give up her fifteen hundred dollar car that she just got a little while ago she's a single mother of four now she's got to give it up for the tow truck yeah. Yeah. now we're still running a tab up there until we decide what to do and they don't want to just give it up they don't yeah. want to give her the car and say well we'll keep the car for that tow truck is there any way nor uh, council yeah. could maybe say you know we kind of jumped the gun and could you somehow or other keep that for the tow truck fee or at least and she's still out the hundred dollars she would have got for the junk in it yeah, but yeah. you know uh, i mean if, if there is any help you can give just to you know make reese's know that we i did talk yeah and i was gonna say uh, yeah it, I would say, and I mean, I did uh, just in this specific situation, and I'll say we've got it in this, but uh, we'll have another meeting following up on this, I think. Uh, but specific situation, I did call the uh, the car lot that had the car. I, I asked them, hey, can they just sign the car over? But 
they were going to get $100, I think, to junk the car uh, originally before it was actually towed. And so the tow fee for uh, once it was towed, it's $115. So they're out the 100 Now they have to pay the 115 And even if they sign the car over to this car lot, they still are going to be out that 115 no matter what. So uh, the, the car lot will just take the store, the $25 a day storage fee as pay, you know, payment for the car, if you will. Uh, the car is payment for that. But I, I personally have called. They pretty much said that the city of Norwood ordered them to tow it. So it's our fault. So they're not going to have the city of Norwood then call them and say, hey, don't, uh, you know, give it back for free because it was us that said we took, yeah. Well, it, it's just, and well, I'll just say, and feel free to give me a call if we have any the specific concern about that one. But uh, I know we're going to try to look at it. Like I said, that's kind of the point of the meeting is that we want to look at this policy to see if there's any way we can, one, increase communication, and two, change the policy so it's a bit more reasonable for how we kind of live today, you know, versus how the city was, you know, back in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, when there was a ton of employees here and a ton of residents here uh, at that time. So cool. With that, I just want to thank everybody. Um, we're going to call this meeting to close. Uh, and then I'm sure Marilyn will start a next community meeting soon. Thanks.
We're going to talk about zoning issues, medical marijuana dispensaries, and new housing infill. And I will do the same things James did. If there's anyone in the audience who would like to uh, comment, you can come up now. Sorry. Tonight we have uh, James Bonzel, Andrew Clark, Tammy Stickley, Marilyn Hanrahan. Um, Brandon Blair is uh, absent. Okay. Um, in the past, we have talked about mar medical marijuana dispensaries. I did speak with um, Jerry Stoker about this, and there are a couple of ways we can handle this. What we want to do is get this um, organized before people can open dispensaries. We can either... Marilyn, do you know the date like, when they can do that? I'm sorry? Do you know when they can do that? No, it's yeah. going to take... A, they're still working on it. I don't have a date. Okay. Yeah, the, the state of Ohio, uh, I think they still have... Uh, like the administrative side of it, they have until like next May or next March spring, to come up with I rules. For, yeah, the spring for come up with rules for how the medical marijuana is actually like how the regulations are going to work, how that's all going to work. Uh, so yes, there's still to be D. She said. Uh, we had talked about this at our last meeting, and we had talked about um, going into our zoning and putting it under retail class C, so we can have no dispensaries until we see. Um, how the how the government is going to decide that they're that they're they're going to proceed with those. When I was speaking to Mr. Stoker, he suggested that we look at uh, moratorium, and then we can put a time limit on it, and that would be the better way to do things. Is with the moratorium, he suggested six months. I'd say at least a year or something, because we don't know how slow anything's going to roll. Um, and all this would do is would stop it from going in anywhere, and then we can sit down and decide where we want it in our zoning. It would, well, I'll let Mr. Gary, but I mean, in the past, how the council have done stuff like, have done items like this, is they just have an ordinance that puts a temporary moratorium over for whatever uh, zoning thing that was. But Mr. Gary, please, if, as a former law director, very much experienced, <laughs> he can help say a lot more than I could. Aren't you glad you showed up? moratorium would generally be done by ordinance. There have been some done by other political subdivisions in the state in response to this medical marijuana enactment. Um, but I think Mr. Bons is right. There's a period of rulemaking that's occurring. I don't know whether we need a moratorium now, but like I said, other political subdivisions, some other political subdivisions have, enact have enacted them. So if you want one, we can draw one. We just need direction as to how long. Yeah, I think our question is how do we proceed with doing something like that if we chose to do it? Uh, just ask for the ordinance and ask. then and then discuss it at council okay. a meeting and then ordain it or not. Okay, thank you. And in order to pass an ordinance, we'll, we'll need to know the length of the moratorium. Um, I think one of the townships in Butler County, and I can't remember if it's Liberty or Westchester, has passed one, um, I think. And then there's some other, like I said, some other, I, I can't say I've done any kind of study about how many or where, but I've just read some stuff. Okay, thank you. In other words, we wouldn't be the Lone Ranger. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. say something. I'm not officially on the committee, but um, I like the idea of the moratorium and doing it for a year just because, you know, six months would put us at maybe at the end of the spring, but that would give some time to see how it actually works once they've got the rules in place and see if it's something we would want to allow in our community anywhere. 
So I think having that additional time to allow it to play out and see it in other communities and how it works type thing. So I would support a year. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I actually agree. Well, I agree with the uh, Mr. Clark, and that a moratorium would probably, in my opinion, would be the best route. And I actually think that we should do this moratorium. I mean, you know, as soon as possible. I mean, you know, working in our normal course of action, only because I want to make sure that property owners and people that are potential property owners in the city of Norwood, that you know, I want to make sure the word is out now that uh, you know, we're, the city council is strongly looking at this because I wouldn't want somebody to buy a property in the city of Norwood thinking that they're going to put a uh, you know uh, I guess uh, marijuana dispensary in there uh, and then you know find out later that oh that's not going to work and then you know they might be out some of the money or some of the value that they thought they were going to get from the property so I don't think it hurts to to start early and start now uh, on getting this done and you know allowing the public to have input uh, especially you know I know the rulemaking won't be done till spring but like I said I, I just I, I, as a property owner you know it's if I couldn't do what I thought I could do with my property, it would be kind of frustrating. So I think it'd be good to get the word out now. Okay, so we're, um, we wanna get an ordinance for that for one year? I'll agree on that, okay. Um, the other issue would be our zoning issues we've been talking about for a while. The front yard play sets went in front of the uh, planning commission and we can go back, they tabled it, and we can go back and talk to them. I was unable to make that uh, meeting because I was at the emergency management meeting with the state of Ohio. They, were, they weren't thrilled with the way it was written. I did sp speak with, um, I spoke with uh, Mr. Stoker on that and explained what we wanted and asked him if he would write it so it was done correctly and the way he liked it. And he said he would do that, so he is working on that. I explained just what we wanted. We don't want, you know, we're not, we're not opposed to somebody taking their babies swing in the front yard or a little pool when their kid wants to swim. We don't want big structures out there. And so he's gonna work on that for us. Um, we talked about the, the, the same thing with the backyard blacktop. We have talked, we have, we talked, we discussed people who can blacktop their entire backyards. This is done for one reason usually, and that's only for parking. And since the city has worked for quite a while for home ownership, trying to bring homeowners in, it does, you know, it's going to stay then, or it's more likely to stay um, a rental property in that case. And I don't want to buy a house, and then my next door neighbor decides they're going to blacktop the entire backyard, and I'm and I'm living next to a parking lot. So he is going to look into that also, and get back with me. The other one we had, we spoke about was the front yard parking pads, which we have all discussed. He. Um, he seems to feel, feel that he, the law used to be you could not park in your front. You had to go all the way to the back. Your driveway had to go all the way to the back. And not all properties can do that. And people want to get off the street. Um, the only, and what I, he, I'm sorry. He felt like people ought to be able to park. My issue was, or not my issue, my thought was 10 feet was wide enough. 20 feet you have, that is, that's pretty wide in front of your house. And that scenario will come up in a minute when we talk about the new housing infill on a house that, that uh, somebody was looking to build over on Ashland. So he would like to know what the rationale is of why we don't like having 20 foot of driveway or parking pad in front of a house. And so he would like us to come up with some rationale for that. Besides, we don't like it. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I hate saying this, uh, but you know, it, it probably is good for, you know, a legislative body to come up with uh, good, I guess, policy objectives before they, you know, decide to implement a policy. Uh, and so, you know, I, I don't disagree with 
the thought behind that. And I'm, I'm telling you, I'm sure we can come up with some good reasons why we don't want parking lots in the front yard, basically, you know, parking pads in the front yard, uh, even though they are, uh, you know, they're slightly restricted. But there's a couple of examples that I've just seen in the past couple of weeks when I've uh, been walking around the city that uh, where you have parking. I mean, I don't know if it, it might be a more historic parking, not just recently when they started allowing it, but there are parking lots, basically. The driveway comes right up to the in front of the house and it just doesn't it doesn't look great it doesn't give a good feel to the neighborhood uh you know and this, these are more emotional things that i'm feeling here but i'm sure there are some studies that have been shown i'm sure there are other objectives that we could come up with or things that we can come up with that could more objectively show that so if we have to come up with that i think it's fine i know that we do have a council person here i guess that lives next to one not that that person might be concerned specifically about that one but might have some experiences with what other residents might deal with when there's a parking pad in the front yard to be honest i mean really it it doesn't affect me personally. Um, I can get, I can understand why people might not like it. And for any other reason, I would think that, you know, just from the aesthetics aspect of it, it just isn't pleasant. You know, nobody wants to see their car, a car parked in front of, excuse me, the front of the house. Um, and I, I would say aesthetics is a common reason why legislative bodies pass laws that they do. Um, if it's not pleasant to look at, um, that that's a good reason to do that. And I think it's, it encourages more rental properties, additional parking, off-street parking, um, even though it's in the front of the house. I think it just, you know, I think we're trying to encourage more owner-occupied um, dwellings in this in this city, and I think that is just another way to encourage additional um, rental properties. I agree. Thank you. So do we agree we want to go forward, move forward with getting this change back to the 10 feet? Marilyn, when did it change from 20? When did it change from 10 to 20? I think it was last year, the year before. What, did they cite reasons on why? They well, I had originally heard it was because people who lived in South Norwood, a lot of them, there's, there's limited parking. But then when you actually read the ordinance, you can only cover so much of your lot, so it wouldn't apply to them anyway. Um, because their lots are too small. So he just thought that, you know, a lot of people didn't want to park in the backyard or they didn't have the room to go to the backyard. Yeah, and, I mean, the current. And I would agree. I think that you're looking at Clinton Avenue, which has quite a bit of rental. You know, we don't want to see a black, I don't, I don't want to see a cement city there. Yeah, and I mean, and it says here. I mean, it's 1153.20d. It says in an R district in the front yard, se in an R district, in an R district, parking in the front yard setback shall be permitted on a driveway, no greater than 20 feet in width, and occupying no more than 25% of the front yard setback. So, I mean, in Blue Ash, that sounds about right. But like when you're looking down Floral Avenue and you're looking at all these beautiful homes, I mean, you know. It, to see cars in front of all of these, especially if you allow like an actual parking spot in front of the homes, not just the driveway. I mean, but you know, to encourage that to e even more uh, in just a historic, really, I mean, in my opinion, historic districts that we have here, gorgeous districts. I mean, I, I think that that could be of concern, and uh, and I am happy to hear from uh, council uh, person Stickley that aesthetics could be a reason because I, you know, I've heard from residents about this, and I think it is a concern. So, yes, I think we should move forward. Okay, we'll go ahead with that. Okay, the last thing we have is uh, for new housing infill. Um, I got a call about a house um, uh, that somebody had put in an application to build, and it um, it was a suburban house. It had 20 foot, 28 feet of uh, a garage in the front of the house, like you would see out in Westchester or wherever. Um, so, and I'm surprised because I thought Mr. Brown was going to be here to discuss this tonight, so we may put this off till the next meeting. Um, he wanted to uh, talk about putting rules and regulations on new houses that are being built so that they um, work with the neighborhood. And I'm just going to suggest that he had the paperwork that he was going to discuss, so I'm just going to suggest we put this off till the next meeting and Mr. Brown can attend. 
Is that okay with everyone? If you yes, yeah. you read some of the. I, I did. I did. So, um, Mr. Brown did send me this document. I wish we I, we did. I did, wish it would have got sent to everybody. Uh, but I, I did read it over the weekend, and uh, you know, it, the, do, the document is pretty clear. I mean, we we don't really have a lot of development standards, if you will, when it comes to some of the things that it talks about. But I mean, it talks really about you know where uh, like. How I mean, how a yard is set out, or how far back the the, the houses have to be, which we do have that. But uh, there, with the way that our current code is, and we, uh, a couple of years ago we rehashed, or I guess redid how the commercial spaces have to look. So there's actually quite a bit of information about uh, how a building has to be situated on a corner and how it has to be situated on a street. And you can't just have a blank wall. Like you've got to have some recesses or do some things to the building to make it, you know, more appealing, uh, you know, aesthetically. And so. Uh, right now, apparently, we can just build a, you know, basically, I think we can just build a, sub, you know, a Westchester-style house and just plop it right in the middle of, like I said, some of our historic districts. And, uh, you know, I'm so glad that our uh, chairperson brought this up because I do think that uh, we should at least look at this and let residents kind of get feedback on this once they realize what truly could be built next to them, especially now that home values in Norwood are increasing so much that it actually is starting to make sense in certain areas of the city to for new construction. Uh, and that new construction, uh, you know, like I said, very much could look like you know some of these cookie cutter neighborhoods in uh, other communities that you know some people prefer. But a lot of people that I hear from that live in the city of Norwood, they live here for a reason, and it's because of the character. So, yeah, I'm really happy that we're looking at this, and I'm looking forward to Mr. Brown coming and talking to us in a few weeks or whatever. Is there anything else? Okay. I move that we adjourn our meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thank you.